Everyone said? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Let's turn to Luke chapter 2 this morning. When you're there, say amen. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Luke chapter 2. When you're there, say amen so I know that you're there. Amen. Go into verse 10, please. Amen. And don't think I'm crazy. I know what I'm doing. Amen? <laughs> All right. It says... An angel of the Lord appeared unto them, saying, Fear not, for behold, I bring good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And he shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes in a manger. We're going to stop there. Jesus is king, yes? Yes. yes. Eternally, etern eternally king, correct? Yes. He is the one that founded and formed this earth, yes? He is king then, he was king always, and he will forever be king. However, when he came to earth, he came in an unkingly way. He came very humble. The Bible says that the angels appeared unto shepherds. Right? Mm -hmm. Lowly people, not dignitaries, not magistrates, not the presidents, not the rulers of kingdoms, but he came to shepherds and made that announcement. He came humbly, not being born in a castle, not being born in a palace with servants all around, <clears throat> but being born in a manger. This is how humbly Jesus came. The Jews had a very hard time accepting Jesus as their Savior and King because he did not look like, as Pastor Mikey alluded to just before, he didn't look like the person that they thought should be the one that would save them from Roman occupation. So think of how God operates. Remember I told you that you can't think of God with a logical mind? Because the minute you think you have God figured out, he says, I don't think so. And he comes around in a, in a, in a completely different way. Amen? So understand this, that he, he came so humbly, but yet he was a king. Every, all the divine power was within Jesus. All of it. Amen? Amen. So I thought about this. The Bible says that during Palm Sunday, he made a triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Right. So what happened between Sunday and Friday? Because he made this triumphant entry mm -hmm. that Pastor Mike again alluded to in Zechariah. We're going to turn to Zechariah chapter 9 right now. Go to Zechariah chapter 9. <clears throat> when you're there, say amen. Zechariah, Zechariah 9, we're going to start in verse 1. I'm sorry, verse 9, you're right. Nope, verse 8. Okay, when you this, Zechariah 9, verse 8. And it says, I will encamp about mine house because of mine army, because of him that passes by, and because of him that returneth, and no oppressor shall pass through them any more. For now I have seen with mine eyes. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king comes unto thee. He is just having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. And I will cut off the chariot from the Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace unto the heathen and his dominion shall be from the sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth and as for thee also by the blood of thy covenant I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein there is no water so understand this that the Jews were looking for a king that was going to deliver them from Roman occupation Jesus didn't fit that bill at all visually think about this Roman historians believe that there were two processions that day. One with Pontius Pilate on the western side of the city, wow. and one with Jerusalem, Jesus coming in on the other side of the city. Mm. Now, if you knew Rome, Rome was very powerful. Rome was the most mightiest army at that time. They rolled over everyone. They were brutal in how they handled things. In the time, the 80 years when the, since they had deposed the king of Jerusalem, for 80 years, in that 80 year period, they crucified over 2,000 Jews that were accused of rebellion. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a true crucifixion. They are brutal. It's not what you see on TV. It's worse than that. They hang you. The reason for the crucifixion is a slow 
agonizing death. When you're on a cross and you have to, your feet are nailed and your hands are nailed, what happens is your, your lungs begin to constrict because all the weight of your body now presses in. So in order for you to breathe, you've got to stretch to get that air. But guess what? As you're stretching, <laughs> all the part of your body that's nailed and everything else is in agony. So you're hanging there for hours, basically suffocating. Yep. And then to make matters worse, when they get tired before sundown, if you weren't dead yet, they'd help you along and break your legs. So you had no strength to pull up anymore, you would just suffocate and die. <clears throat> so, Pontius Pilate was coming in with his procession on a stallion with a whole army and chariots behind him, centurions marching in formation, showing power and strength. Going to go to the other side. Mm, come on. Here's Jesus yeah. on a donkey. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What? He's on, a, he's on an ass. He's on a donkey. Yeah. Coming into the city as a triumphant entry into the city. On the other side, there's Pontius Pilate showing the power and majesty yeah. of a ruling individual. With the pomp and circumstance, here comes Jesus. Again, not how you would picture a king to enter his glory. He's coming in, but the people recognized him because in Matthew 21, it says they threw down their clothes and they threw down leaves and said, Hosanna, thou son of David. They acknowledged who he was. So what happened? Thousands of people come out to see Jesus. On Sunday, and the same people on Friday yell, "Crucify him!" So what happened? They want their immediate. Because according to, the, according to what the Jews thought, they were going back to Zechariah. I'm sorry, they weren't going back to Zechariah. They believed that their deliverance was going to come through a powerful king and a mighty warrior. Jesus didn't fit in that bill. He did on the inside. But he came humbly to this earth to save people, and he came humbly into Jerusalem. So now what happened? What's the first thing Jesus does when he gets into Jerusalem? Where does he go? He goes to the temple, the place of worship. And what does he do there? He does it now. He doesn't come in calmly. He goes in turning tables over. Can you imagine? Here comes this man on a donkey. He gets off the donkey and goes into the temple. And he sees all the corruption. And he starts flipping tables over. He says, my house should be a house of prayer, but you have turned it in to a den of thieves. All of a sudden, he's not that liked anymore. Because now he's rocking the establishment. Because do you know the people that hated him the most? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and all those people that were in power at the time. And they weren't even Roman. They were Jews. They couldn't recognize the Savior when they saw him face to face. So he goes in and he starts turning over the tables and then he has the audacity in the temple to see sick people and say, you are forgiven of your sin, go and be well. Right. Now I don't know about you, but if, if there's a visitor that comes into church and they have the power of God and they're laying hands on people and people are getting, getting healed. And pass them back and I can say, no, you gotta go. You gotta go. Get out, get out, get out. <laughs> but they didn't want that. The Pharisees didn't want Jesus to be known that way. So as I was doing this this morning, and I was just filtering this through my head, <coughs> I was flipping through the news, and I saw this article on Donald Trump. And it says the Republican Party are getting ready for a strategy to derail him. Yeah. Wow. And I said, wow, I said, he, uh, he's ups he is upsetting the Republican Party because he's speaking truth, maybe not the right way, <laughs> but speaking truth like a bull in a china shop, just like Jesus. I'm not calling him Jesus, don't, don't, don't get me wrong, but going in and flipping tables over. Yep. So the minute you do that, your popularity starts to plummet because no longer is it acceptable for the status quo. Yes. So the whole week, so you can got to understand something. When Jesus ministered, he said... If someone can tell you to go a mile, go with him twain. 
Do you know what he was referring to? If you were in the field and you were a Jew, and a Roman soldier was marching, and the Roman soldier, keep in mind, they had the, they had the shield. They, they, they had everything with them. When they got tired, they could take it off. They could come and grab you and say, Joe, take my stuff and walk with a mile. You had to pick up that stuff, and you were obligated to walk with them for a mile. People that you hated, that ruled over you with an iron fist, you were obligated to walk with them for one mile and carry their stuff. And here comes Jesus saying, don't go the one, but do it twice as much. Yes. Are you crazy? <laughs> do you know who they are? <laughs> we hate these people. They're ruling over us. They're killing us. And Jesus says, don't just walk the mile. Go two. Do you see how Jesus blows your mind? <laughs> he goes against, even today, he goes against everything your flesh wants to do. <laughs> God. You go in some place and somebody says something nasty to you. Your flesh wants to rip, rear up. And what does Jesus say? Love your enemies as you love yourself. No, Jesus, excuse me, I want to kill this guy. <laughs> Jesus says, don't do that. <laughs> Love, That's right. peace, joy. He goes against everything that we think we should have or we're entitled to. <laughs> see, Jesus never came as his glory. See, we know him as such. We see it. But can you imagine to a Jew who was oppressed, who wanted the Roman rule out, <laughs> who's been crucifying my brothers and sisters for 2,000 years because of rebellion? Can you understand the Pharisees? Understand something. Do you think the Pharisees were fair in their exchange in the temple? No. Absolutely not. So all of a sudden, Jesus comes and he exposes that. And now all of a sudden, you, you got your brothers and sisters who are looking at you saying, you're no better than the Romans are. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And all of a sudden, it becomes to start to unravel. Yeah. So the Pharisees have to, have to get rid of this guy. Just like the Republicans have to get rid of Trump. We've got to get rid of this guy. He is making way too much noise. He is causing way too many waves. They want to get rid of Jesus. They already plot. How do we get rid of this guy? I don't know about you, but here Jesus walking around. The blind see. The deaf hear. The lame walk. The possessed get delivered. Is there anything wrong with that? No. But everywhere Jesus went, every time he did something, they go, by what, a, by what authority do you do these things? I don't care what authority you're doing it. I was blind, now I see. That's all I know. Yeah. The Pharisees went to grab this guy that Jesus healed from being blind, and they said, who did this? Like it was a bad thing. Who did this to you? Who did this? And he goes, I, listen, I'm going to paraphrase here. Dude, I don't know who did it. <laughs> all I know is two seconds ago, I was blind. This guy touches me. Now I can see. I don't really care who touched me. Right. <laughs> I can see now. But they insisted. Who did this? Who did this? Like it was a bad thing. Everywhere Jesus went, he met with resentment. Because people don't want to change. So even today, in this week when we lead up to Easter, do you want to change your way of living? Do you really? Or does Jesus come across to you as a pain in the neck? Love my enemies as I love myself. I don't know about you, but that's a tall order. <laughs> I don't know about you. But there's people that get on my nerves, man. And, I, and it's all that I can do just to stand and look at you, let alone love you and everything else. I'm being, come on, I'm being honest. There's a guy at work that comes in. He, he's got to probably be the most arrogant person ever. And, and you know people who know everything? Well, that's this man. So if you ever want to find something out, call me. I'll get you in touch with him because he knows everything. And then he comes up to you. And then <laughs> and I'm looking at him. And I say, okay, God, here we go. And I get a smile on my face. I'm like, God, get me through it. Please get me. I'm bigger than he. Is, please get me through this. <laughs> and he comes with the arrogant tone and the speaking down to you. And yeah. like, and I talk to him, I, he makes me feel like you're four. And I'm saying, God, please make it quick because I'm going to kill this guy. Thank you, Jesus. Make it quick. But I have to love him. But see, 
I don't like it when Jesus tells me to do that. Because my flesh wants to tear this guy up. Up one side and down the other. Thank you, Jesus. Amen? That's not how Jesus, Jesus said, love them. But see, everywhere he went, that's what he said. Love them. Love them. Forgive them. Love them. Be peaceful unto them. What if another country took over this one and tolerated your religion or your belief? But we're in a completely different rule. Say, let's just say communism took over. Now you can, you can worship over there. Because see, the Romans allowed the Jews to worship and do what they wanted. But guess what their watchtower was? Right next to the temple. So they could keep an eye on what was going on. Because if you started to get, up, if you started to get uppity, they would squash you right quick and in a hurry. And don't think the Pharisees and the Sadducees and everybody else that wanted to derail Jesus didn't know that that was being going on. Because they started to set Jesus up. Crucify him. He's an upside. They go to Pontius Pilate and accuse Jesus of being in rebellion. What did he do? He never spoke against the government ever. He spoke against the religious system, which was Jewish. He never spoke against Rome ever. That's why when Pontius Pilate goes, I see no wrong in this man. He's done nothing wrong. If you want to crucify him, he's yours. You penalize them. But they pressed and pressed and pressed and pressed until the day that Jesus stood before the people who not five days before said, Hosanna, thou son of David, were throwing palms and everything else in front of him, acknowledging who he was. And then they bring out Barabbas. Yeah. Barabbas, yeah. <laughs> How hypocritical is that? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not even going to go there, so I'm just going to just, I have something to go through my mind, but I don't think it'll be appropriate for this. So, yeah, okay. let me get off that track. <laughs> Barabbas comes out, a known criminal, a known organizer of rebellion, kills Roman people, and here's Jesus, healed, brought peace, deliverance, love, healed people, rose people from the dead even. Yeah. I see nothing wrong with this guy. And they choose Barabbas. And they yell at Jesus saying, crucify him. Why? Because in the presence of Jesus, you cannot continue to be who you are. You have to know. The, let me tell you something. When you have an experience with Jesus, <laughs> It changes you. Nobody in this room who's at, who has actively met Jesus can be the same. You can leave the church, you can go back in the world, but guess what? It's not the same. Because you had an encounter with Jesus Christ. You can walk away from Jesus, but guess what? Jesus is never walking away from you. The Holy Spirit is always going to be dogging you out there. But if you met Jesus, you, you know his kingship. You know the power he has in your life. John 15 says, without me, you can do nothing. But if you are in my word and my word abides in you and you abide in me, ask me anything you will and it will be done unto you. How do so many people, addicts, get delivered? Divorces get healed. Sickness gets healed. Blind people see. Well, Pastor, that happened 2,000 years. No, no, no. no. It's happening today. Yes, it is. Do you know why it doesn't really happen too much here in America? Lack of faith. Lack of faith. Oh, you believe in that stuff. Well, they get children in Africa healing people. Yeah. Because doesn't the Bible say that we need to come to Jesus as babes? Yeah. What does a child do? If you tell a child, go over there and pray for someone and God is going to heal them. Does the child say, oh, well, you know, I don't really believe in that because healing left right. No, they just go over there and they start praying for them. Exactly. And they believe what you tell them. Right. Jesus said, that's my word. If you just did it and went over and prayed with, you would see people get healed. But we have this thing called doubt. 
See, because we don't truly, and I hate to say this, but I think it's really true. In the American church today, we believe in Jesus, but we don't believe in Jesus. Called Called lukewarm. Lukewarm, and we always question. Don't we? Well, you know, and the enemy is great at this. You know, d- does Jesus really mean, you know, you're going to get healed? To- yes! Yes, yes. Because the minute you believe something, do you know what the problem is? We come up and we, and we pray at the altar, and we're not even off our knees yet, and doubt comes in. Yeah. And Jesus said, according to your faith, be it unto you. See, Jesus wants you to be locked in. What procession are you following today? Are you following the world's procession? The Pontius Pilate because it's strong, it appears to be glorious, it appears to be powerful? Because like Jesus said, there will not be one stone standing upon another. When Jesus comes back, every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord. So think about that. Think about you back in the day when you saw Jesus riding in on a donkey. And think about what's going through your head saying, what? This is the king we've been waiting for? But they knew something was up because thousands of people lined the road. So they knew. But where was their faith? Day one, day two, day three, day four. When the establishment said, He's a troublemaker. He's a liar. He's a false prophet. He's a this. He's a that. Until the day that they crucified the Savior. But you know, when you think about it, God had the plan. That's right. In John chapter 1, it says, From the foundations of the world, He has predestined us to become sons and daughters. Now, predestined doesn't mean that he picks a couple of people and says, you're going to do this. Predestined means that everybody has the same opportunity to get saved. So, when the judgment seat comes, and we're standing before the judgment seat, and we're we're not going to get judged like a non-believer, but guess what? No one can say to Jesus, you showed partiality, because the Bible says he has no respect to a person. He goes, I gave you every opportunity that I gave him. They responded, you did not. You chose not to believe. You chose to go the other way. You chose to take the wide road when they chose to take the narrow road. They were offended in me. Are you offended in Jesus today? Because Pastor Mike said, sometimes we root. We'll talk about our our baseball team or our basketball team. I'm so sick of basketball. (laughs) Already. I said, oh dear God. Because we're watching, my wife was watching basketball, and she's with the team. And I said, oh dear God. I said, do you guys realize that this doesn't mean anything? (laughs) It doesn't mean, I hope they win. So what? (laughs) I ran into people. Don't get me wrong. Do I want to see PC win? Yes. Because they're a home team. But am I going to go nuts if they die? I could care less. (laughs) There are people dying of salvation. I'm worried about stupid basketball. Come on. Just a side note. (laughs) But that's what we worry about. We don't concern ourselves with what Jesus wants. Where Jesus is going, where this world is going. Listen, are we praying for the upcoming election? We should be. We should be be crying out. Like Pastor Mike was saying, look, it doesn't matter if it's blue, red, independent, this, that, it's Lord. Who is going to do the best job for you? Who is going to honor you the most? Not because, oh, I would love to have the first woman president. Okay, well, I don't I want to have this one. Huh? All right. I want to go with that one. Right. I'm saying, Lord, because there's so many idiots on the podium, I need your wisdom yeah. to pick one out. Yeah. I need your logic. I need your guidance because this is ridiculous. Amen. Because you can't pick anybody that you can trust. Yeah. So you got to look at Jesus and say, Lord, lead me. Who is it that's going to represent you best? See, that's what we should be doing. That's what it means to follow Jesus. It means to raise your kids up in the way that they should go. It means to have your marriage in the way that it should be. It means to have your life aligned with His. Is that how we're going today? If you say something in the church that people are offended with because it's the truth, people leave. Guess what? 
You're going to go to that church across the street, and guess who's going to be following you? The Holy Spirit. The Holy, hello. Spirit. The Holy Spirit. <laughs> and you, you know what? You know what? God is so good. He'll He'll let you sit, <laughs> and He'll let you fall in love with that church. <laughs> and the pastor will say something stupid again, <laughs> something you don't like, <laughs> and then you're going to be up and going again. But guess where you go? You go to the next church. Guess who follows you to the next church? The Holy Spirit follows you again. Because guess what? When you hear truth, you are responsible for it. In the day when Jesus was walking into Jerusalem, those people, like you and I, were responsible to respond to the truth. And yet they said, crucify him. The very same people that acknowledged his lordship and his kingship Sunday we're watching him die on Friday. Think about that. Does your life resemble that? Because you would never outcry, crucify him. We would never say that, but guess what? Your lifestyle does. Your, your way of thinking does. The way you handle situations does. Your disobedience does. Think about it. Think about it. Every time that we don't do what the Lord speaks to us to do, it's like saying, crucify him. He's not the Lord of my life. And then, as we'll talk about next Sunday, when we close with this, we believe in the resurrection. But how can we believe in the resurrection when we don't believe in him in certain areas of our life? Do you see how weird this gets? You can't, you can't pick and choose. <laughs> I love, I love that. I have a lot of Catholic friends. Many, many Catholic friends. And they're great people. But I gave an analogy to them. Again, they didn't like it, but I had to show it to them anyway. I said, you know how you live your faith? Oh, I don't like that. Uh oh. I don't, I don't like that. Rip that out. And you go through the Bible and you systematically rip out what you don't like. Guess what? If it was up to me, I wouldn't read this thing at all because I don't like any of it. Because every time I read it, it shows me how imperfect I am. But the, also the good thing is, is every time I read it, I see God's grace for me and his love for me and his deliverance for me, saying, come out of that darkness into the marvelous light I have for you. Come into the resurrection life that I have for you. You don't have to go back, excuse my, my expression, to the vomit that you've been spitting out. Do you ever see a dog do that? They, they vomit and they go back to it? Yep. Yep. That's how Jesus equates when we do that. When we read the word and we get to know who he is and we go back to the world and we eat the vomit. Why do we do that? Jesus what? said, I have so much more for you. I have resurrection life for you. And next week we celebrate the resurrection. But I'm going to make you really aware of this week. Where do you stand with Jesus today? Are you saying, Hosanna, 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 and then you live a life that's contrary to what Jesus says? And on Friday, you'll say, crucify him, because I like my sin more. Do you know when you get delivered from sin? When you love God more than that sin. Amen. Think about it. Yep. And a lot of people true. haven't gotten there yet. They like their sin. And you know what? You can't play stupid. You know what? I love people who... You ever see an ostrich when they don't want to hear you? Or they get afraid? You ever see what they do? Yeah. But it, all their head's in the sand. The head's about that big. But their butt's about that big. <laughs> so they got their head in the sand thinking, oh, I'm going to hide. Yeah. And you're like saying, really? I can see you. <laughs> and that's what God does. You can, you can say that the God's word doesn't apply to you in this area. Stick your, head, go ahead. Stick your head in the sand, but your big butt's hanging out. And God can see that. So who are you playing? We've, listen, church, listen to me. We've got to get in line with who Jesus is. Why is it so difficult for us to get in line with what Jesus said? We say we believe it until the rubber meets the road. Until somebody punches you and Jesus says, oh, turn the right cheek also. Okay. <laughs> and he hits you on the right cheek. Do you know what I mean? It's, it doesn't make sense for us to live a life that's contrary to the word because isn't that hypocritical? Like I was saying to, I was saying to my wife just on the way in, 
I said, how many people live so contrary to the word, but they'll come into church and pretend everything is okay? Everything is great. Praise God. I'm sinning my tail off from Saturday night, pretending to be a Christian on Sunday, and Monday through Saturday doing the same thing. But yet you come here, and you say, oh, Hosanna, Hosanna, thank you, Jesus. And the first second you get when you leave here, it's crucify him. Because that's what your sin does. When you willfully sin against the Lord, after you know the truth, you're saying, crucify him. I don't want anything to do with this Jesus. But, when we're sick, and someone else is sick, we cry out. And Jesus says, you cry, you're crying out, but you don't believe in me. You only believe in me when you need something, or when you're sick, or you're desperate. But did you ever think, if you cried out to me every day, you wouldn't be sick and you wouldn't be desperate? I'd give you the abundant life, I'd give you the new life, I'd give you the resurrection life. See, folks, listen. Everything that we, during praise and worship, it was so funny. God is so good. He was saying to me, why is it, I like when he asks me a question because he doesn't want me to answer it, <laughs> but he just poses the question so you start to think about it. Yeah. He said, why is it that people don't trust me to give me their stuff? Because what I'm going to give you back it's so much more than you're giving me. Yeah. So I'm thinking about that, and I, and, I, and I start thinking the weirdest things, like we have a profit sharing thing at work, where if you put 5% of your paycheck in, the company will match it. And in walks one of the guys that work for me, and he's upset because they took money from him. I'm saying, dude, do you, do you, do you understand what you're saying? <laughs> Where, what bank can you go to today that you're putting $50 in today and you're getting 100 back tomorrow? <laughs> ding, 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 ding. I don't know about you, but maybe you're financially inept because you can't grasp the thing of 100% return. <laughs> Christian, you're giving God junk, sin, lust, fornication, anger, jealousy, selfishness, low self-esteem, ugliness, imperfection. And he says, I'll take it. And, oh, there you go. <laughs> Deliverance. <laughs> Hallelujah. I called the right time. <laughs> She's going to be a firecracker in the service. Imagine burping in the service. Man. <laughs> Greg, did you get that? That was so cool. I like <laughs> <laughs> I lost my train of thought here now. Give it to the Lord. To the Lord. <laughs> Amen. I'll give it to her. There it is. But, but listen, but to, when, you, when you worship and you understand grace, you understand what God has done for you, and you understand the, how lopsided this thing is, and you say, man, it's a win-win for me all around. It's, <laughs> what is the problem? What goes on in our head that we want to hang on to the junk when Jesus says... Give it to me. Give me the addiction. <laughs> give it to me. Like that, I'll give you, yeah. I want immediate gratification too, but guess what? The minute I walk out of here, I want my heart to be light. I want my stress. I, I, Jesus, I want to take your yoke upon me because it's easy. It's light. Do you know what a yoke is? Do you ever see an ox plow a field? That big thing around its neck that makes it push? That's what the enemy straddles you with. And you're trudging through life, just trying to make it one day to the next, one second to the next. You're falling on your knees, you're stumbling, you're eating dirt. Jesus says, take my yoke on you. It's easy and it's light. Because he takes that off you and he puts grace on you. And he says, now walk with me. I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'll be with you until the end of the, until the, end of the age. What a great trade is that? No other God that I've ever read about does that. Yeah. None. The Muslims require, they, their God requires things of them. Every, every one, and I've studied a lot of them, every God requires a sacrifice. All what Jesus wants is your heart. That's it. I'll give you my heart, Lord. And Jesus says, I'll give you everything else. Let's all stand. Amen.
See, next week, we all know it's Easter Sunday. But we can truly celebrate Easter the right way. Or we can celebrate it the wrong way. I want the right way. I want the resurrection life. Yes. See, if you don't have resurrection life today, it's not because it's not available to you. It's because you choose. Remember we talked about choice last week? Yep. Remember a few weeks ago, I told you that it's like Jesus has all these gifts for you. It's like Christmas when you have a big box. And I like unwrapping gifts, but it's like having a big box and saying, here you go. And you don't open it. You say, thank you. You take it home and don't open it. Mm -hmm. That's the gifts that God has given you. There's so many of you that are not opening or taking the gifts that Jesus has given you. Understand what grace is. Amen? Amen? Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Father, we come before you. Father, we're not perfect people. And we, Father, you of all people know this. And Father, you accept us for right where we are. Father, help us, Lord, to see you for who you really are. And not be deceived anymore to think that we can go and do what we do and get away with it. Because, Father, every time that we willfully sin, it's like us crying out with those people, crucify him. Father, we want to line up with Jesus. We want, to, we want to be with Jesus. We don't want to be like the people that scattered when, when confronted with the decision to either be for him or against him. Even his 12 disciples fled. He was completely and utterly alone. People that said that they would die for him denied him. Father, we don't want to be the same type of people we want to be a people that will say, Jesus, I'll be with you. I'm for you, not against you. I'll run to you when other people are running away from you. Father, when the world says they hate you, I'll stand up and declare, I love you. When people say they'll serve a softball team or a basketball team or a baseball team or a job or a family or whatever, I'll say, as far as me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Father, we want to be on the right side. And that's being on your side. Father, help us to get to that point. Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us out of our own selfishness into a life that's sacrificial to you. Because, Father, you want the best for us, but you want our best. Father, as we leave today, I ask you to bless your people. Yes. Cause them to be the head and not the tail. Yes. Cause them to be above and not beneath. Father, bless them in their travels. Give them traveling mercies wherever they go. Yes. Set your angels round about them. But Lord, this week, let there be an inward introspection to say, Lord, are we the people that cry out Hosanna one day and crucify him the next? Father, help us to realign ourselves with you this week. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Be blessed, guys. Have a great week.